Now, before we go on any further, let's just cut across uh, to Boris Johnson, who's currently addressing the House of Commons. Record investment in, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, uh, hope that the independent NHS pay review body uh, will listen carefully uh, to what my honourable friend has just said. We now come to the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, my thoughts also, and I know the thoughts of the whole House are with the families of the victims of yesterday's school shooting in Texas. Nineteen children have died, some as young as seven, and two adults believed to be teachers. It is an unspeakable tragedy, and our hearts are with the American people. Yeah. Last weekend marked the anniversary of both the Manchester bombing and the murder of Lee Rigby, and re we remember them this year as we do every year. Yeah. And today is also the anniversary of the killing of George Floyd, a reminder that we must all tackle the racism that is still experienced by so many in our country and beyond. Mr Speaker, the Sue Gray report was published this morning, and I look forward to discussing that during this afternoon's statement with the Prime Minister. For now, I want to focus on the cost of living affecting the whole country. Mr Speaker, since we stood here last week, and I ask the Prime Minister yet again to back Labour's plans for a windfall tax to reduce energy bills. Hundreds of millions of pounds have been added to bills of families across the country, and hundreds of millions of pounds have landed in the bank accounts of energy companies. It sounds like he's finally seen sense, and the inevitable U-turn may finally have arrived. So when can people across the country expect him to use those oil and gas profits to bring down their bills. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, there's nothing original about a Labour plan to tax uh, business. There's nothing remarkable. They want to tax business uh, the whole time. Every day, uh, Labour wants to put up taxes on business. And what we're doing is we're helping people. He asks when we're going to help people. Yeah, we're helping people now, uh, Mr Speaker. And uh, we're, we're, we're putting £22 billion into uh, people's pockets already, cutting uh, council tax by £150, cutting uh, fuel duty, cutting national insurance contributions by an average of £330 for people who pay, for people who pay NICs. And, Mr Speaker, how can we afford that? Uh, because we have a strong economy, because we came out of Covid fast, Mr Speaker, which would not have been possible if we listened to the party opposite. Fifteen tax rises, and he pretends they're a low-tax government. <laughs> it's been, it's been, Mr. Speaker, it's been four and a half months since Labour first called for a windfall tax on oil and gas profits. I've raised it week in, week out, and every week he has a new reason for not doing it. The business secretary said it's bad. The justice secretary called it disastrous. Yeah. Even this weekend, the Health Secretary and the Northern Ireland Secretary opposed it. He ordered all of his MPs to vote against yeah. it last week. Yeah. And now, surprise, surprise, he's backing it. <laughs> Prime Minister, I'm told that hindsight is a wonderful thing. <laughs> but, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, Whilst he dithered and delayed, households across the country suffered when they didn't need to. What? Peter. Mr. Bone, a man who always wants to catch my eye is not going the best way to do so. Keir Starmer. Mr. Speaker, whilst he dithered and delayed, households across the country suffered when they didn't need to. What is it about the Sue Gray report that first attracted him to a U turn this week? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker there, is, there is no surprise about Labour's lust. There's no surprise about Labour's lust to put up taxes. Uh, there's nothing original about his thought. They, they get off on it. Uh, they, they absolutely love to confiscate uh, other people's assets. What we prefer to do, Mr Speaker, is make sure 
make sure that we have the measures that are in place to drive investment in our country and drive jobs. And it's thanks to the steps that we took, uh, thanks to the fact that we came out of COVID faster than any other European country, which would not have been possible if we'd listened uh, to him, uh, that, we, uh, that we now have unemployment at the lo- listen to this Un- they used to care about this mr speaker unemployment at the lowest level since 1974 and, uh, put that in your pipe Here's Starmer. Uh, mr speaker i actually thought with this u turn he might actually get his, his head out of the sand but uh, obviously not the reality is that every day of his dithering and his delay 53 million pounds has been added to britain's household bills Whilst he's distracted, trying to save his own job, the country has been counting the cost. But complacency is nothing new for this government. Back in October, the Chancellor delivered a mini-budget that has to be re-read to be believed. With inflation already climbing, he said that he understood people were concerned about it and the government was ready to act. Since then, inflation has risen to a 40-year high, the highest rate of any G7 country. If the government was so ready to act six months ago, why hasn't it? But, Mr Speaker, the government has acted, and my rival friend, the Chancellor, continues to act. This is the government that not only... We were not only put in the living wage, Mr Speaker, it was a Conservative institution, uh, but we've now raised it, by, raised it by a record amount. We've raised it by £1,000, uh, Mr Speaker, a record amount. Uh, we've helped people, families on universal credit have another £1,000, Mr Speaker. Thanks to the measures, the £9.1 billion we've already put in uh, to support people's uh, costs of heating, uh, we're abating the costs of fuel uh, for people up and down the country, and of course uh, we're going to do more, Mr Speaker. We're going to put our arms around the people of this country, just as we did throughout the COVID pandemic. uh, But but the reason we can do that is because we took the tough decisions to drive the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe, which wouldn't have been possible if you listened to him, Mr Speaker. And that's why we have, and let me take another statistic, youth unemployment. They used to care about it. Youth unemployment at or near a record low. Mr Speaker, it wasn't just the Chancellor back in September. The Prime Minister called fears about inflation unfounded. He was the last person to spot the cost of living crisis, just as he's the last person to back Labour's plan to help people through it. And, Mr Speaker, it wasn't just on inflation that they got it badly wrong. In the same speech, the Chancellor boasted about growth, the Prime Minister does today, and we were going to do better than all our major competitors. It was obvious that he was being complacent. And lo and behold, Britain is set to have the lowest growth of any major country except Russia. Despite our brilliant businesses and all we have to offer, why has his government inflicted on Britain the twin-headed hydra of the highest inflation and the lowest growth? He he loves running this country down. times did he come to this place how many times did he come to this place and say that the united kingdom had the highest covid death rate in europe how many times he was proved completely wrong did he ever apologize mr speaker absolutely not did he ever take it back absolutely not mr speaker actually because of the steps we took last year we had the fastest growth in the g7 and we will return and we will return to the fastest growth by 2024 2025 thanks to the decisions that this government took mr speaker and and Miss, they, they don't care about getting people into jobs. They don't care. Uh, we care about the working people of this country making sure we have a high wage, high skill, high employment economy. And that's what we're delivering. He talks about running this country down. He is running this country down. And it wasn't just complacency on Labour's windfall tax, which he's now backing. It wasn't just complacency on inflation, which is now through the roof. And it wasn't just complacency on growth, which is now spluttering along at the back of the pack, because his Chancellor also claimed that people should keep more of the rewards of their efforts. And then he put their taxes up. 
So does the Prime Minister want to explain to hard-working people whose wages are running out sooner and sooner each month and who are facing astronomical bills and prices just how his 15 tax rises since taking office have helped them to keep more of their rewards in their pocket? Mr Speaker, first of all, what we're doing is making sure after a huge pandemic uh, that we are funding our vital public services, uh, which we can. Uh, because of the steps that we take. What we're also doing is making sure that we put more money back into people's pockets by the, the measures that I've outlined today, uh, whether, through, whether through cutting national insurance contributions or lifting, or lifting the living wage or lifting universal credit, Mr Speaker. But all this is made possible, all this is made possible uh, because we took the, the re responsible and sensible steps to protect our economy throughout COVID and then to come out strongly. And he's completely wrong about this country's growth performance, Mr Speaker. He runs it down. He runs it down. He was proved wrong about COVID. He's going to be proved wrong again. Just delusional. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, last week I raised the case of Phoenix Halliwell whose kidney condition means he needs daily dialysis and whose energy bill has gone through the roof as a result. I'm glad that, as a result, government officials got in touch with Phoenix yesterday, and I hope that will result in more support for people who are vulnerable. But it shouldn't be left to Labour to turn up week after week to make him aware of the consequences of his dither and delay. So I want to raise another issue where the government is sleepwalking into disaster. Yeah, yeah. With the summer holidays looming, there are reports that the Home Office already has a backlog of 500,000 passports to yeah. issue. Yeah. That's potentially more than half a million people worrying whether they will get away this summer. So can the Prime Minister reassure people that they won't miss out on their holidays due to the failures of his Home Office? Yeah. Well, I, I, I thank you very much, but I can tell him, actually, uh, that what we're doing is massively uh, increasing the speed with which the passport office uh, deliver. And uh, to, the, to, to, the best of, to the best of my knowledge, everybody is getting their passport within four uh, to six weeks, Mr Speaker. Uh, but, that's, but, but that is because, that is because we, we, are, we are driving the leadership of this country. And... Uh, we are getting things done that would never have been possible if we listened to them. We got Brexit done, Mr Speaker, when he voted... He voted 48 times. 48 times he voted to undo the will of the people. We got the vaccine rollout done when he would have kept us in, yes, in the European Medicines Agency, Mr Speaker. We were the first European country, the first European country to help the Ukrainians resist Anybody seriously believe for a second that they would have done it? Some are trying to boo, some are trying to cheer. The worst of it is, I can't hear the Prime Minister. Come on, Prime Minister. Let me, let me, let me say very plainly, does anybody seriously think for a second that the Labour Party would have done that, Mr Speaker? When, when eight, eight of the shadow front bench, including the shadow foreign secretary, who is mysteriously not in his place, uh, voted recently to get rid of this country's independent nuclear deterrent. And, and he campaigned, he campaigned to put Vladimir Corbyn, I mean, sorry, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn in Downing Street, Mr Speaker. Uh, we get on, we do the difficult things. We do the difficult things. We take the tough decisions, Mr Speaker. Social care, social care, we're fixing it. Prime Minister, we both can be on our feet. I'm trying to help you. You've got to help me as well. And I'm sure you've got to the end because Mr Stewart's itching to get his question. Graham Stewart. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. When the Prime Minister gets passionate, things get done. Brexit. Brexit is done. The vaccine... The vaccine... The, if they could contain themselves, the, the vaccine rollout done. So will, so will my right honourable friend personally intervene 
so that the immunocompromised, like my constituent Scott, can get access to British wonder drug Evosheld, and then they, not, not uh, next winter, not next year, but now, so that they can enjoy this summer and enjoy their freedom, just like the rest of us. Yeah. Minister. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, I know that the, uh, my, my, my honourable friend and has taken a keen interest for, for, in this for a while. Uh, Evershelled could potentially reduce the risk of infection, as he, as he says. Uh, we've got to look at the uh, available evidence before we can make a decision about whether it should be available. But I will make sure that the uh, Department for Health and, and Social Care keep him updated on the progress we're making. We now come to Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Aye, aye, aye. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to join others today to express my deepest sorrow at the horrific events in Texas yesterday. Nineteen children and two teachers have needlessly lost their lives. Many of us in Scotland will be remembering the tragic events that took place in Dunblane 26 years ago. The thoughts and prayers of the SNP are with the families suffering today, but also our hope that lawmakers will finally act to bring the scourge of gun violence that plagues the United States to an end. Mr Speaker, the reports that the Prime Minister and Downing Street's lawbreaking have been damning. Empty bottles littering offices, rooms so crowded people were sitting on each other's laps, and security forced to intervene because the parties were so outrageous. At the centre was the Prime Minister orchestrating it, grabbing a glass for himself in order to toast the party goers. For eight months, we have heard every excuse under the sun, but now, now we have all seen the damning photo evidence. While well, people stayed at home to protect the NHS, the Prime Minister was engaging in drinking and debauchery that makes a mockery of the gut-wrenching sacrifices that each and every person made. For the Prime Minister, will the Prime Minister now take the opportunity and resign? Uh, Mr Speaker, I can, I can tell the, the right honourable gentleman that uh, much as I appreciate his advice, he'll have a further opportunity, which I'm, uh, I'm sure he will take, take with his uh, customary length uh, to, to, to debate that matter uh, in the course of the, of the statement which will follow directly after PMQs. I'm not happy. Ian Blackford. It Mr Speaker, but it's all a joke to the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has lost the trust of the public. He has lost what little moral authority he had left. The Prime Minister has apologised many times, not because he feels any genuine remorse. He still refuses to even admit that there were parties and that he presided over them. He apologised for one simple reason. He got caught. The reality is no apology will ever be enough for the families of people who lost loved ones. For the families who followed the rules, who stayed at home whilst their nearest yeah. and dearest to them were yeah. dying, and are now forced to look at photographs of the Prime Minister surrounded by drink, toasting to a party in the middle of a lockdown. If the Prime Minister will not accept that he must resign, then the Tory benches must act. This Prime Minister, who has broken the law and shown a cavalier attitude to the truth, cannot be allowed to remain in office. Prime Minister, time is up. Resign. Resign. Resign before this House is forced to remove him. Prime Minister. I, I, I thank him very much. I would uh, just uh, uh, direct him again. I think it would be uh, uh, to his advantage to uh, look through the report, and, uh, and then uh, I think we should return to it after PMQs. We now come to Jonathan Gillis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. High streets and heritage means a lot to the people of Stoke-on-Trent, North Kidsgrove and Talk. Bursham and Tunstall, two of the great six towns of Stoke-on-Trent, are plagued with rogue and absent landlords who are too happy to let shops sit empty and historically important buildings such as Price and Kensington Teapot Works fall into ruin. Which is why I introduced my proper maintenance of land bill to increase fines on these ruinous owners. Can my right honourable friend confirm that as part of the government's planning reform, 
He will adopt my bill, which imposes a new unlimited fine, so these reckless reprobates can be held accountable. Up the veil for Saturday, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Well, uh, yeah, 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 Mr Speaker. Uh, up, up the veil. But uh, on the, on the, on his, I want to thank him, by the way, for his campaign. Uh, he, I think he's entirely right, uh, and that's why we've adopted the measures that he proposes uh, in the bill. Uh, those who leave properties derelict unreasonably uh, could face an unlimited fine, Mr Speaker. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I was pleased to uh, meet the Prime Minister last week in Royal Hillsborough in my constituency. Uh, we welcome his commitment to introduce legislation to deal with the protocol on the Irish Sea border uh, and to protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. That will take some time. In the meantime, as in the rest of the United Kingdom, hard-pressed households in Northern Ireland are suffering from the cost-of-living crisis. Will the Prime Minister give me an assurance that any measures that are brought forward by the Chancellor uh, in the near future to help hard-pressed households will apply to Northern Ireland and that the protocol will not be allowed to prevent Northern Ireland citizens receiving the support they need from the Government at this time? I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman very much. Uh, as, as he knows, uh, we have a package of measures uh, for, to support families across the whole of the, the UK that I've uh, detailed al already to the House. Uh, I may say that I also think it would be uh, an advantage to the people of Northern Ireland in tackling uh, the issues that uh, uh, we all face across the UK uh, if, if, if Stormont uh, were to be uh, restored, uh, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The recent report on levelling up the rural economy highlighted many areas where more work is needed in small rural and coastal communities to ensure they also benefit from our levelling up agenda. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that we need to ensure levelling up reaches into rural and coastal Devon? And will my right honourable friend meet with me and Helen Herford, our excellent candidate in Tiverton and Honiton? our plans for Devon. Yes, of course, Mr Speaker, because my honourable friend is a fantastic advocate uh, for Devon, for rural uh, communities, and I will make sure that both she and Helen Herford uh, get a meeting with the relevant uh, minister to discuss her ideas further. Ben Lake. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, rising fuel costs are causing serious problems for workers in car-dependent rural areas like Ceredigion, and for carers and district nurses, the situation has reached a crisis point. One carer from Ceredigion often has to travel 29 miles just to reach the first service user of the day and travels around 1,700 miles each month. Would the Prime Minister therefore consider extending the Rural Fuel Duty Relief Scheme to areas like Ceredigion to help my constituent and many like her to continue their invaluable work. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I thank him for his excellent question. And I can tell him that uh, a rural, uh, a fuel, du fuel duty relief uh, is there to compensate uh, motorists uh, uh, by helping re retailers in some uh, more remote r rural areas where pump prices uh, can be significantly uh, higher. It, it currently operates on a geographical basis, but Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy uh, to ensure that uh, the Honourable Gentleman gets a, a meeting with the, uh, the relevant minister as fast as possible. Stevenson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Prime Minister, yeah, yeah, yeah. Labour and Socialism has failed this country because they have followed policies which interfere too much in people's lives, yeah, yeah, yeah. over-regulate, spend too much taxpayers' money, borrow too much yeah. and raise taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could the Prime Minister tell the House what policies his government are going to follow to ensure we don't have a similar fate? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Mr Speaker, I, I can. And I'm, I'm grateful to, to, uh, to my honourable friend, and he's absolutely right. Uh, that Labour's instinct everywhere and always is to put up tax uh, with all its uh, absolute. Uh, that's what they well, they're, 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 they're bragging about it today, Mr. Speaker. It's ludicrous. Uh, and uh, what we are doing is not only cutting uh, people's contributions under national insurance, uh, but also cutting. Uh, the uh, cutting the uh, helping people helping businesses to invest with the 130% super deduction uh, that my honourable friend uh, put in, and what that is doing is helping us to have a high wage, high skill economy with unemployment. Unless I said this before, Mr. Speaker, at the lowest since 1974. Jill Furness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Days before the election of disgrace, former Conservative MP Imran Ahmad. Khan, his victim warned the Conservative Party of the abuse he had suffered. Oh, 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 oh. Shh, shh, shh. Sit down, sit down, sorry. 
it, there's still, I think, an appeal in sub yeah. so if you can be careful, I just word the question. Yeah. Shocking, shockingly, they failed to act on this report and still won't explain why. That's why Rotherham Child Sexual Exploitation survivor Sammy Woodhouse has called for an independent investigation into the failure, warning that the Conservative Party have broken the trust of victims. So, will the Prime Minister personally back those calls and launch an independent investigation until the failure to act so that victims can have confidence that his party will never again turn a blind eye to it? Yeah.